We want to talk about discerning the many voices that Paul teaches about, writes about in 1 Corinthians 14. And then we realized that as we got going and studying that whole scripture in context, it really is laying the foundation for a credible representation, a witness in these days in ministry and real life of the spirit of prophecy. There are many times I've taught, God has had me be in the spirit of prophecy since 1991. He's had me teach on it many times for many approaches. I started this. There are many voices in the world and each one has significance way back as far as 1996 in my aunt's little teeny tiny church in Ashland, Virginia. And we filmed it. I was on the local area. But anyway, it's been a, a season of maturation for many of us. And a lot of us just want to get what is the real deal about a lot of things in ministry, in real life, relationships, and how does the spirit of prophecy come across when we teach about it, when we resemble it, when we're in the office of the oracle prophet, maybe as a leader, maybe we're trying to aspire, we think God has called us, that's a better way of putting it, you can't achieve it, God has to work it through you and in you like Paul in a process. So we're trying to despookify it, we're trying to demystify it, make it more down to earth, relatable, and I've taught on that many times, I have a website you can look at, a couple of them. Um, PurePropheticPrinciples.wordpress.com is the old one, the spookifying, the minute, the spirit of prophecy. Also, the newer one, we're redoing it slowly, is PropheticPrinciples.org. My name is Tavo DRC, and you could call me uh, Pastor T, T, whatever. But anyway, God is so good. Teacher, trainer, teenager, whatever you want to call me is fine. So let's get in with the Lord. We're going to teach on. There are many voices in this world, and each one has significance. Paul is writing to the carnal church of all people groups back then, the ones on the seaport of Carnith, which was full of mixture and carnality and uh, people trying to have a party spirit and trying to be elevated and pick favorites and have fan clubs and celebrity and all those things. Hey, it sounds like a lot of today's ministry. So let's just let you hear and let's ask for God's wisdom. You'll need God's wisdom and clarity from the Holy Spirit, balanced by the Bible book, the Word of God, in a New Testament sense, minus legalism, minus all law, to really discern and really despookify, make more approachable, user-friendly, as it were, but never use people or never use anybody that God doesn't, you know, to make it down to earth in a New Testament first church sense. Let's go to the Lord in prayer because this is a not, it doesn't have to be a spooky subject, but it is subjective. That means your discerner, perceiver has to be sharp to see is it really the Lord or is it really some other person's opinion? Is it weird doctrine? Is it, you know, from other some other source? And we've been there. We've tried to really let God winnow us completely many times and we submit it to you as sila that's why we submit this to you as a sila pause and think of it but we're not saying this is going to be dogma we we teach on the spookifying the uh the spirit of prophecy really because there's there's been so much historical in the last 30 years in that different movements of different kinds of different kinds of people groups that work with the word prophecy or teach on being a prophet or say they are an apostle prophet that comes with putting up big capital A, you know, almost like bow and scrape, worship the office. It's so spooky or that people who follow these kind of people, some of these can be so super serious or dark or, you know, because of doctrine, overly introspective, navel gazing, as it were. We've seen those. We've been around them. We didn't like it very much. That's why we're out of that kind of move. We're trying to make it more like let's be natural you don't have to be normal, because this is supernatural, but not super spiritual. It is supernatural in the fact that, just like James 3.17, and this is a criteria for our teaching of any kind of ministry, of any kind of topic, the spirit of prophecy, anything I say, you can judge it by the fruit of James 3.17, where it says, and this whole teaching right now, but you can't get it all in one filming you have to get it in several so we may continue if the lord allows but the idea is that if you go by discerning and judging not accusing judging not critically you know appraising or critical judging but judging by the spirit 
of the word, of the person who delivers it, the demeanor, the fruit when you meet with them, if it lines up with the wisdom of God described in James 3.17 by the overseer, apostle, pastor, the half-brother of James, the natural brother of Jesus, rather, James, pastor of the church, and he wrote in very relationship ministry, organic terms for back then, he said that any wisdom in James 3.17 that comes from above, that truly comes from above, that says it's a minister and they say I represent God or I'm a teacher or I'm an apostle, I'm a pastor, whoever, I'm a layperson, I've got a word of the Lord, a written word, spoken word, an advice word, any word that comes from above, any wisdom, presented wisdom that comes from above can must pass this test, the litmus test of James 3.17, that it's pure, peaceable, easily entreated, won't argue or get in a fist fight if it doesn't agree, come to blows. It's easily entreated, full of mercy and good fruit. The fruits of the Spirit of Galatians 5, written by Paul, uh, which would be love, joy, peace, patience, meekness, temperance, and all the self-control, personal self-government. Alrighty, and goodness of God. Any wisdom that comes from above is, first of all, pure, peaceable, easily entreated, full of mercy, and good fruit, without partiality. No pets, no favorites, no respecter of persons, religious spirit, no bias, no bigotry, no racism, ageism, genderitis, whatever else, uh, denominationalism. And it's without hypocrisy. It's not two-faced or phony. And to the best of my ability, we're trying to act, you know, minister and be like this and represent the Lord as our ambassador for Christ, just one of them, in that same fashion. So here we go. We want to speak on the, there are many voices in this world. Even if we never get in touch the spirit of prophecy, that verse alone is amazing. 1 Corinthians 14 and the context, the packaging of 1 Corinthians 14 verse 10, which is Paul's writing to the carnal church back then, the ego-driven church in certain quarters, not all of them. In fact, there must have been somebody pretty calm and level-headed because one who didn't have a huge ego was the concerned Chloe, a woman of the church, woman of God, who wrote to Paul, please come, because they're at, you know, almost at fisticuffs, at blows, this ego, I am for Paul, I am for only the teachings of Paul, I am for Apollos, and Paul comes and writes them back in 1 Corinthians 3 and 1, saying, don't say that, don't confuse everybody with religious spirits or ego infighting, Let's get on with it. I am just for Christ. We are all for Christ on his team. That's how we're trying to build this ministry. It is God's ministry, not my ministry. And he can have it any time and do whatever he wants to with it in whatever way. And that's why I guess we're on the slow road back and free live stream. And we're grateful for it. Man, it's a gift. It is. I think it's easier for me, at least, to use. You can make MP3s with it and everything else, I think. Anyway, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we invite you, Holy Spirit, we need you to help us. We need you to help us detect false doctrine, false opinions, things that are not that are contrary to you and your word. Lord, any doubt, unbelief, any wrong error, any fear, any anxiety, any weirdness, Lord, we ask that you give us mercy, grant us grace to help us discern your voice, your tone, your meaning of all this behind this message. We invite you, Father God, to be with us, and Lord, help us all to be of good cheer and have no fear. That's why we're here. God bless you. God, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. The Lord is so much fun. I have a lot of fun. I'll be honest. We really don't take ourselves too seriously. That's why at one point I'll get funny, I'll get humorous, because I'll think, you know, we're only passing through. This is an eternal point of view. You know, just let's get what we can and keep on marching toward the higher call of going to heaven. But I think um, one time I had a thought come to mind. I put it on a T-shirt on Twitter, and it said, over here at the d loft in our ministry, we're trying to say, I don't take my religion too seriously. Let's don't take our religion too seriously. I don't take myself too seriously let's don't take ourselves so seriously get all upset like that but i do take the lord seriously that's the word we take the lord seriously it's for his government to be upon his shoulders not my <clears throat> archbishopness or whatever that would be or mean to anybody 
but it's about the Holy Spirit, about the Lord, about the freedom to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul, with all thy might, and worship the Lord, not ourselves. Let me get a glass of water here, and we'll get going. We'll submit our selah. We're thinking of having open meetings. We're, our plan is to have a gathering, not to have it a ministry club or you have to join or select. It's open because we want people to feel led by the Spirit, like Ezekiel Wheel, Holy Spirit drawn fashion, to come and assemble and gather here and seek the mind of the Lord, network, be there for an appointed time, and then leave. That's it. So if you're hearing that, you want to be a part, we do need uh, God sent helpers. I have couple but we need more that are dependable reliable even to have worship later that God called worship team more than you know maybe two people or more I do I have the keyboard but anyway God is able so when that's time we'll know it and you'll know it but you can contact me with at be creative t at gmail.com lowercase letters be creative t lowercase letters let's go for it this is a relationship move of God. We're talking about relationship theology, seeing it from when Jesus Christ represented the office, prophets of all the prophets, the apostle A of the capital church, the capital A apostle, chief apostle, even over Paul, over all the rest. He still didn't come wrapped in an ego. He came in infant humility, but he stayed that way even when he grew up. So the spirit of prophecy, when you teach on that, has to come with all the trappings of the New Testament prophet, which is Jesus Christ, the ideal role model of how he treated people with respect, interacted while he was alive in ministry and on land in his personal life with his mother Mary, he honored her, and all these types of things which we're trying to do right now. We try to honor those ministers and fathers and mothers that are before us and other booths and say thank you so much. I wouldn't be here. I couldn't have been here if I had not had great doctrinal infrastructure in my life, but thank and honor my also my pop, um, natural parents and grandparents who were Christ Christian role models as leaders, and they weren't arrogant, they weren't lightheaded, they were sober, but they were fun and had genuine humility with a quality of excellence. So I honor them and all of you as well. We go to look at just the tip of the iceberg when Paul writes. He writes to the church. He said, you know, you're hearing a lot of clamor. You're hearing a lot of, and today we'd say, you're hearing a lot of media. You're hearing a lot of all these voices out there. There are many voices in this world, even right now, and each one has significance. That's 1 Corinthians 14, 10. So let's name some. There's the media. There's your own inner voice. There's the voice of the good shepherd, the Lord, who gives life to his sheep, it says. There's your mama, your daddy, your father foe, your friend, your enemy, your backbiter, there's the cultural voice, there's the uh, persona celebrity or the ideal voice of media, magazines, and even ministry. There's the cell phone message, there's the email, there's the dream in the night. There's so many voices you can't even name them all. There are the memories that you have. There are so many things that go on. There are many voices in this world. Your friends, your social network, your neighbors, your best friend, your pals, all these things, and some of them are right on. They're really true, and some are not, and this is why you need to know for yourself, each voice by each voice is a different case, which one is from the Lord. It's got to line up, as we mentioned, James 3.17. There are many voices in the world and each one has significance good or bad friend or foe loud or soft but they've got to line up with James 317 to detect them first base detecting two verses they've got to be first of all pure peaceable easily entreated full of mercy and good fruit without partiality without hypocrisy and without did I do it all it doesn't hurt to repeat pure, peaceful, easily treated, full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Secondly, we need to have freedom from fear, F-E-A-R, the capital F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. Fear is false wisdom. It comes with pressure, it comes with packaging, it comes with a lot of accolades, it comes in the night, it comes with mystery because we can't figure out anxiety, worry. 
All right, so if we realize that there's a scripture, if you get advice or counsel or you hear a voice in your night, any energy, any person, any uh, back talk, any kind of dream or anything, and it, and it doesn't, it has a spirit of fear attached to it, then you can weed that out and say that is incorrect. Something is not right. Here's the scripture for that. Besides James 3.17, when you're winnowing the subjective matter, it would be for, uh, 1 Timothy 1.7. The it is written says, God, the Holy Spirit, Father God, the Creator, has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, His power, love, and a sound mind. So if it's going to make you crazy or you're weird, Thank God that ain't him and get to grow in the Lord. You can renew your mind and choose to grow because that's a sign you might need it if you have some weakness there. So getting rid of fear and when you talk about any subjective spirit, anything, you know, even imaginations, you want to make sure it's not got fear, anxiety, or worry. You can just kick it out. Years ago, I had this trouble with fear. It sort of ran in the family, the culture of our whole family, like being nervous or not making sure you want to be perfect, you know, gnawing fear. And years ago, about 10, years, eight years ago, the Lord just dealt with me. He said, it's like that old Wizard of Oz movie when Dorothy would be walking through the woods or whoever was walking through the woods and it would say lions and tigers and bears. Oh my! And they were feeling apprehensive. They were feeling strange and, you know, what's going to happen next? It's going to get us. And so the Lord said, when you feel that presence, that weird feeling of pressure, that false evidence appearing real fear, that anxiety, that temptation to be afraid to run from it, don't be a chicken. Instead, remember, it's just a lion, a, a false, you know, it's from the devil. Lions or tigers and bears, oh my. I like Psalm 112. I'm putting a lot out here, but I'm going to try to make it MP3 so you can play it again. Psalm 112, verse 7, for the righteous man, the righteous human, it said, the righteous person will not fear evil tidings. Their heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. That is a good one for right now. When we teach on the subjective quality of discernment, of perceiving what is the will of the Lord, what is the way of the Lord, what is the word of the Lord, which is like a spirit of prophecy or counsel or encouragement or whatever that we may need, we have to know that all of this comes from the inner realm where it can be discerned and judged and matched against scripture, even if you have your scripture on your little app like I do today. And it can be known that when you get a word from the Lord, if you are prone to call to get a word from the Lord or get a scripture from the Lord or give help to people with counsel, that all of this comes from, if you're a Christ follower, true Christian, it will come from your relationship with the Lord. So when we teach on a spirit of prophecy, a good spirit of prophecy, the wholesome quality of, spiritual, of the spirit of Christian prophecy, will come based on the things found in the New Testament in your relationship with the, and love, your first love of being with and hanging around the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul writes, to the church in Ephesians 1.17. He says, I pray that all of you will have more wisdom, <clears throat> excuse me, more of God's wisdom, more of God's revelation, that means ability to hear from God and give his messages that are, you know, fresh manna. He said, I pray that more of you, all of you will have more of God's free gift of wisdom. You'll have more revelation from the Lord in your knowledge of Him. That means not knowing books about Him. There are many books about God, and there's a lot of teaching about God and people who know about God. But this means your time knowing God Himself through a relationship, inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior, uh, submitting yourself to really wanting to please Him every day and grow in Him and then reading your Bible, studying, get good teaching, get good fellowship and all of that. I'm reminded today how that when before there was any kind of sin or hurt in the world, any nursing of grudges, any men's or women's ministry and all that type of thing we know today, that there was Genesis prior to the fall in Genesis 3. There was the organic, original divine appointment, the divine creation of God wanting to have a relationship with a child of his own, the firstborn son, Adam, 
And when he made Adam in Genesis 1 and 2, he made him good. And then there was nothing broken, nothing missing. It was shalom rest. There's nothing that would hinder or mar, mess up the communication between God and Adam. It was perfect hearing. Now, when we're in this part with, you know, the world, the flesh, and the devil because of the curse brought on in Genesis 3, then we find out now that's where we have to go carefully in teaching, especially against Levitical patriarchism or, you know, false doctrine or fear or, you know, what is really discernment and balanced by the Holy Spirit in the book of, uh, of the New Testament, the New Testament. We're trying to make it clear. So when Adam and Eve had their relationship with God, first it was Adam, the firstborn son, the governor of the planet, overseer, and he and God hung out together, and that's when God gave him his instruction. Adam, before Eve was even formed, Adam, I don't want you to eat. You can have anything you want in this garden. Just don't eat of one thing. Just please me, Adam. I'm the Lord. I made it. I'm going to ask you not to have any of that fruit of that one tree, the knowledge of good and evil. And because nobody was there, I guess Adam had no excuse but to hear God because they had this great relationship. Every was, everything was perfect. Well, then later, God loved his son, his firstborn son, Adam, so much that he said, you know, Adam and I have this great relationship, but it's very healthy and wonderful. But, you know, Adam's still lonely. He needs another companion, a helpmate. So God formed the woman out of Adam's DNA. And that's why women are not second-class, second-rate vessels, because they're, Adam wouldn't want to put down his own DNA. That's how it, Eve was formed. Now, see, these things are not logical, but because of life not being logical all the time, people get upset, things happen, weird stuff happens, you have dreams, you have mysteries, then we can say there are two sides, there must be two sides to this life, this world, even though it looks concrete, it looks... There's evidence there's only one kind of way. There's still the before creation, which is eternity. There's still what happens when you lay down, die, and give up the ghost, so to speak. And there's after creation. That's a mystery. That's part of the supernatural need to get really prepared and read about it, study about it, grow in it, not be afraid of it. Because one day it will happen. In the meantime, there are tests and trials and weird things that happen, things that need prayer. That is a mystery. That's supernatural. It's not beyond logic. I teach on logic. I like to be logical. I prefer to be logical. I prefer to be natural, down-to-earth, you know, natural things. But there are strange, unpredictable mysteries that come in, and you have to be ready in your relationship with the Word, how to handle it. I find that if you don't know when to go to prayer when to stand on the word, when to just worship and praise God and thank him for the miracle to happen, you know, to be led by the Spirit. Those are things that are in your inward witness, deceit, perceiver. You don't want it to be the deceiver, but you want it to be your perceiver, discerner. That's why we're teaching on this so that you can get it better. It's not a formula. You can't make it happen. Nobody will ever get it 100% right all of the time, but you can grow in it and get better. So people that are, are really good at that, may meet a person who just thinks that is the hardest thing. I'm really concrete. I'm very analytical. And there's good parts of that. There's good parts of both if nobody gets too flaky and nobody gets too hard. All right. How do you tell when to solve a problem? How do you go and you solve a problem as a Christ follower, a born-again person? How do you know which way to use? Do I go to prayer? Do I go to laying on of hands? Do I need a miracle? all those things that are more spiritual, supernatural, and when do I just go hard work, you know, get it done, stand up, do it right, keep it happening, make it happen type thing. And you know what? That is between you and God because it's between you and God who loves you, who wants to tell you if you'll let him and allow him. He'll tell you this is the way I want you to do it now. This time, this week, you're going to need this approach, logic concrete facts, get it done, stand up, do the right thing. You know what? Another time, another week, God may say, you know what? I'm not going to be predictable. You're not going to put me in a box of your own making. You're, you're, if I'm the Lord, you're going to have to let me train you and use you in a different way, method. 
I'm going to say this week you need to stand, renew your mind and faith. You need to believe. You need to do all these things which are invisible and just trust me. Another time you may say, you know what? Like Matthew 22, 29, I've taught him recently, Jesus said you need both the scriptures and the power of God or you could err. So this week I'm going to say I'm going to teach you how to discern and be led by the inward witness. How to rejoice in the Lord always. How to praise the Lord and not pout. How to keep going. I mean, there's so many things you can't fit it in this tape. But that's our topic. And we love to minister on this type of thing. Because it's a relationship with a pure heart. You and God. You know, the Bible teaches us that Jesus said in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Beatitudes, He said, Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. That's a mystery right there to a lot of people. Blessed are the pure in heart. Well, your pure in heart would be a James 3.17 example type of heart, maybe. But then the other part would be they shall see God. How are you going to see God? Is he going to show up? Well, even Moses didn't get to really see God, but we believe that could mean you're going to perceive God. Act on your behalf. You're going to perceive the way and will of the Lord. You're going to perceive the presence and power of God as your gift and your blessing. There are way blessed are the pure in heart. You're going to perceive God clearly without as much because you're not a fault finder. You're not a fibber. You are a true person who wants to please the Lord. Even if you fall and make mistakes, you get back on the horse and ride again. And you want to know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering in a relationship not just to get the goods out of his hand not just to say daddy i want i want this this week i want that next week i want i want why aren't you run, doing my bidding because he's trying you he's trying me because he wants a pure heart lord i'm in it for the long run i'm in it for the call i'm in it for eternity i'm not in it for the short term here and now and we're not. Okay, even though you got to get a drink of water once in a while, do something fun, play around and have a, you know, have fun with life. The idea is that you listen, you discern, and you, it's a process to, to grow in this, but you discern, you learn to discern the voice of the good shepherd, which gives life to his sheep. Back then, my family who were not charismatic or Pentecostal never heard such when I was coming along. For some reason, they were Presbyterians, Methodists, and Baptist background, but they heard from the Lord they would be led by the gentle Holy Spirit, inward witness, peace, and the Bible. So when I teach on things that are sort of far out to some, outlandish, the spirit of prophecy, all it is is going back to that and thinking, you know, all it is is they could give a word from the Lord that would edify, comfort, and strengthen somebody, and that's and uh, 1 Corinthians 14, we're just about to get to it. We need to get to that now. So we're teaching on the spirit of prophecy. We're teaching on there are many voices in this world, and each one has significance. Even if you don't want to go there to the spirit of prophecy, or you have a fear, or you're not pure-hearted, or you've seen people just use that office and abuse people with title, pomp, and circumstance, then you can still learn on discernment and you can still ask God for more grace to hear clearly, which is all we've done. Years ago, when I was a, I had been brought up Baptist, but you know, not we're, we always thought Christian first, Baptist or any other kind, you know, second. My parents were not re overly religious. My dad and mother, Baptist pastors, thank God. Or my grandparents, we laughed, we joked around, we had joy. They weren't racial bias. They didn't, you know, have bigotry. And I want to keep that going. I'm so grateful for that. So really, for, we're for all colors, all people. But you got to hear God. You know, whatever kind of earth suit God puts you in, he chose to put you in your earth suit. He chose mine, this Western European background, to try the hearts and minds of certain kind of people, even myself on some days, because I am five foot nine and a half. That used to try me when I was a teenager, being that tall. But the other part is he put you in your earth suit from Africa and descendancy and Asia or whatever else, Greek or Jew, whatever it is, for such a time as this. So embrace it. Know yourself. Enjoy it. And bring it forth to serve the Lord and be a good witness with it. 
there are many voices in this world, and so we have to think, you know, there are voices now that are prejudiced, that are accusing voices. What is the voice of the Good Shepherd that gives life to his sheep? That's why this is needed, so we can have more people that understand we need to give life, not darkness, out in the world today with our voices, with our music, with our comments, with our teaching, our writing. All right. 1 Corinthians 14. I'm using the app Bible today. Uh-oh, where'd it go? I thought I had it all set up. You know, I have two phones. One of them is this business phone, and that one's been acting more. Let's get this one going. Let's get our Bible up. 1 Corinthians, I'll be using the King James Version. Years ago on the East Coast, when I was back in ministry, maybe the late 90s, I met a pastor, a wise pastor, and he told me that the King James Version was what most uh, traditional pastors go by when they study senior pastors. But he said that the NIV was written, you know, you can get all in a big sniff about this, but he said that the um, NIV was written by somebody that left a lot of words out. So you want to watch out. Let's see. Isaiah, we're going to go to, to 1 Corinthians. I have the Holy Bible online. Let's see if you can see it. I had the one that was on, that we had to have Wi-Fi, but I like this one so much better because I don't always want to be online. The Holy Bible offline is what I'm using today. And we're going to 1 Corinthians 14. I'm just going to start at the top. Let's see. Wrong chapter here. Funny that we get into the moving, uh, talking about different things that are spiritual, the spirituals. And in this chapter of 1 Corinthians 14, the many voices also talks about tongues, talks about the spirit of prophecy. And all those things are very prone to cause controversy in many Christ followers, at least in the United States, and they have for many years, because there's certain traditions or bigotry or lack of knowledge error attached to them, and we're trying to make it cross-buddy to you, true and to depackage that, tell you what we believe, and then see what you, to give a new meaning so it's not quite so accuser-prone or stereotype in that fashion. So I'm prefacing chapter 14 of Corinthians 14 with reminder that when we come to this chapter, it's right after the love chapter written by Paul about all the love things. So love is more important. And what is love? It's about relationships that are kept in harmony, kept in ongoing, enduring love walk, Philadelphian church love walk of Revelation 2, the end time bride of Christ, whose doors will never close, it says in 2 book of Revelation. Let's get over to 1 Corinthians 14. It says, Paul writes to the church. This is the church that's new. Nobody's had a Billy Graham. There's nobody had had this, their first generation believers figuring it out with God's help, prayer and fasting, fasting, and then all the different things that come from past people that are still, you know, haven't been quite refined. Knowing the Lord, there's no Bible. In this cross, multicultural, diverse seaport with the Jews and the Christians and all the different other kinds of idolaters. Now, knowing about God and Christ, and then people have their egos still. They haven't been you know, around long enough. And Paul is having to speak to these people because they're so forceful and they have such big opinions. Some, Many of them have not even forgiven their old racial prejudices. They haven't forgotten their cultural biases. They're still, you know, wanting to keep on the family feuds that divide people even like today. Oh, good. Interesting. Also, they talk about women in this chapter. Very controversial chapter. But no matter what we're going to talk about in chapter 14, 1 Corinthians, it says, Paul writes, follow after charity. That means mercy, love, enduring love ongoing. I would say, I would dare to say, James 3.17, character under pressure. Follow after charity, writes Paul, and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. Now that one has been taught and retaught and retaught as long as I've been around. 
all right, everybody like, ooh, prophecy, you know, it gets really, your brain sort of creaks up and you don't understand it, or you've heard this, or you've heard that, or you think, man, it sounds too weird or far out or boring, I don't know what you think. So we're going to say, Paul says, first, mercy, love, compassion for one another, no matter what, desire, at least ask for it. Years ago, I was going to say this earlier, I forgot, when I'd been brought up all the different, you know, traditional I mean, really, here at God, but Presbyterian, all the, all, before all these moves came, uh, you know, on the scene back then, like faith and prophecy and all these teachings that came out with the TV media age, I grew up with people who discerned the Holy Spirit, like I said, the voice of the Good Shepherd, and did that just as a common way of getting guidance and family decisions, unity, but then the Bible, believing the Bible was God's holy word. So nothing bothered me, you know, I didn't have to get into a big hissy fit over any type of prophecy. I would just discern it and say, did I feel the Lord on that? Was it in the Bible? So when you hear the word spiritual gifts, I, you know, back when I was like in my 20s, I was hearing that, didn't quite understand it a lot, but I thought, you know, well, Lord, if you want me to pray in tongues, I'll do it if that's your will, and he gave it to me. And then if you want me to have discernment of spirits, Lord, I ask for discernment of spirits. If you want me to have it, he gave it to me. But it was never wild, didn't shake me, didn't make me act weird. It was very natural and calm, and that's what I believe God's Holy Spirit is to me. And so when I teach on the spiritual gifts, and then I teach on the spirit of prophecy, to me it's like natural. The, it, the natural is very supernatural, and the supernatural is very natural to me. It's like, oh, okay, you don't do it to like beat somebody down or put on a show or go over the top to hurt people. You look at people and you discern their boundaries. You're discerning, perceptive. You're careful not to criticize or make people feel forced into anything. That's how I do it. So Paul said, I would that you, and he's commanding them to fall after mercy, love first, then desire spiritual gifts, and that you may prophesy. Well, then everybody wonders, what is prophesied? This is what I would think the American general population thinks, because this is what I've just, you know, as God had me study for 40 years, ongoing the body of Christ. I notice that when you get to certain parts of the body, this is my opinion, that they think of prophecy as the following. This is of two or three of the following is what it seems to be the general people who talk, you know, different kinds of people use that word prophecy and they think of it as this. They think, oh yeah, you're in a service, they're singing, there's quiet, all of a sudden somebody speaks a word in tongues, they wait and pause, and somebody, usually the pastor, interprets it, and they think that's a prophecy. The other kind is then you get a word, an oracle message from a, a, a person in a local lampstand church or on TV, or a national prophet either writes or speaks a spoken word of the Lord to that nation. In America, they seem to think, and this is not accusing, but it looks like a lot of people who are in the spirit of prophecy really sometimes get back under the law because they don't know Hebrews 1 and 2, where it says in the old days God used the former, the prophets of the Old Testament to give the word of the Lord to his leaders of the Hebrew people. But in the New Testament day, now he speaks through Jesus Christ, his son, and that's Hebrews 1 and 2. So we're careful to say, if I'm going to speak as the office of the prophet, which I am, and if I'm going to teach on the spirit of prophecy to help people who feel like they're called in the office of the prophet, or at least know about it, grow in it, then I'm going to warn you and caution you that we're not back under the law. We're not into the day where we're going to call down, you devil, you you know, you're worshiping, you're just evil. That's back under the law. We're going to say, in this scripture, and it's farther down, discern those voices, it has to look like Jesus, who is the office prophet of all office prophets, New Testament church style, and the apostle of all apostles, New Testament church style, leadership style. And if you read his actions and mature spirituality and his emotional empathy, and he wasn't compassion fatigue. You read about him when he was alive on earth in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You're going to see that that going around, hanging around with the brethren and sister and his mother and his relatives with out in public, that he was always very kind and he was never calling down fire, calling people sinners or devils or witches or 
warlocks or anything else. He was not an accuser. He was the Messiah. The only people he ever rose up to were the accusers, his accusers, the Pharisees. And he went into their temple with a prophetic act, but he never used violence. He never used weaponry. He never used accusation. He just stood up and said, you've made my father's house into a den of thieves. All right, so those things, the mammon chasers were the only ones that they were God's, Jesus' own Hebrew kith and kin in the spiritual sense. So you can study Hebrews 1 and 2 for yourself. I like to think that in the New Testament we can look at Jesus as the ultimate role model. Revelations 10, 19, or 19, 10, excuse me, one of those says, you can Google the verse, it says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Jesus never once appointed his disciples, the men, to look, keep their eye out for witches and warlocks and Jezebels. That is too deep in the Deep South prophetic right now. You don't see that dark theology, that dark, you know, accusation re resembling the accuser resembling. You see the Messiah, the Messiah who represented Isaiah 11, 2 and 3, who had all of God's power, fear of the Lord, all seven spirits of God, the counsel of God, the might of God, the wisdom of God, the spirit of the Lord. And you see him in the New Testament representing the oracle office as also 11, 2, and 3, that he came with the fear of the Lord. He was sharp. Jesus Christ was sharp of discernment. And he would not judge. He never yielded to accuser, far off Phariseeism, or sin spying, or witch, you know, dark demon labeling, or, you know, synthetic character qualities. But he went about doing good and it says that he would not judge by the sight of his eyes nor make decisions based on what he heard. Jesus would believe gossip or the evil report, neither would he allow it. You know why? His relationship, these are all relationship things that hurt relationships in the body. When there's no fear of the Lord, when people are not discerning and they're rude or disrespectful, when they are judges and critics and they call themselves Christ followers, those relationship issues that hurt the body, but they also hurt the name, the good name of Jesus Christ and Christ following, church going, Holy Spirit gets grieved. That's my opinion. Let's get back on 1 Corinthians 14. Paul is writing, follow charity, desire spiritual gifts that you may prophesy. Well, what is prophesying? Well, we're going to get there in this chapter. First of all, Paul writes in verse 2, For he or she that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men but to God, for no man understands him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. So if it talks about speak, praying in tongues, a prayer language, you can just do that very matter-of-factly. Ask God for one and a friend that... You know, she just asked God, and at the kitchen table she got it, and it's down to earth, no, you know, nothing big and frightening. So you and the Lord can do that or get somebody, a leader, to pray for you, lay hands on you. All right, so it says, I would that you would speak in tongues, pray in tongues, because it's going to build you up and it's going to communicate unknown mysteries with God. It'll help you with your guidance. I know that for a fact. But it's not going to be really helpful to do a lot of that in public in front of people because it really, nobody's going to have the interpretation. They won't know, and it's just between you and God for the most part. However, verse 3, but, that's the praying in the Spirit. Verse 3, but he or she that prophesies speaks unto men for edification, exhortation, and comfort. So you can edify, strengthen, and comfort. You can exhort. That means, brethren, you, be, you, know, you better get your act together. Things are going not well. You're not really embodying Christ's ministry where it says in 2 Corinthians 7.14 that your land is going through all this process because the church, you yourselves, brethren and leaders, have not repented and sought the Lord like he said. I mean, that's exhortation. <laughs> but it, you know, some these days think that is condemnation. They're super sensitive. But between you and, your, and the Lord, that's your business. He and you need to figure it out with discernment based on maturity, emotional healthiness, and then what is right. But it says that he or she that prophesies speaks unto humans to build up, that means edify, exhort, get their act together, and comfort. Edify, comfort, and strengthen is also a good way of putting it. 
verse 4, he, they're comparing the spiritual things that could go on in a person's life, in their home, their family, in a group, in a fellowship. He or she that speaks in an unknown tongue, one, builds themselves up, edifies themselves in the Holy Spirit, empowers, invigorates, gives you mysteries that you don't even know you're praying about yourself, your needs for that day, intercession, whatever it is. It's very practical. To me, it's very down to earth, very life enhancing. However, those that prophesy, so there's the tongue being used for personal edification, speaking mysteries to the Lord. Then there's the tongue being used, the human tongue edifying the church, bringing, building up the church. Did it say tearing down the church, cutting down another pastor, slinging names from a pulpit of public television ministries? I've heard that, but I don't think that's in the Bible. He that speaks in an unknown tongue builds up himself or herself. He, she that's prophesied edifies, it's supposed to edify, build up, and strengthen, exhort, and comfort the church. Whether the church is a teeny little handful, whether it's a big mega ministry, all right, it edifies. Paul writes, I would that you would all speak in tongues, I would that you all speak in tongues, but rather that you prophesied, for greater is he that prophesies than he that speaks in tongues, except he that interprets that the church may receive edifying. So if there's a controversy, you know what? I'm going to say, I've heard this. You're not going to go to heaven if you don't speak in tongues. You're not going to be good. You're not as worthy if you don't speak. Hey, listen, that is right here saying that isn't true. That's fault finding. That's legalism. And you know what? I put up Ephesians. God gave me Ephesians 4 common doctrine, which is really the the first tier doctrine that you have to have to be a real Christ follower that's a real true Christian, I wrote an article and this, speaking in tongues does not, or prophesying, does not mandatory on the fact that it's not common doctrine. It is preferred doctrine, but it's not first level. It means you've got to hear God for yourself and you need to. You really need to do that in this day and age. 1 Corinthians 14 Paul writes, I would that you speak in tongues, but I'd rather more that you prophesy. I'd rather you more, not that you're some eloquent office of the prophet. I've got to have the word of the Lord. I've got to be the office. I am the P prophet. No, that's stilted, flaky, and it goes on. But instead, your humility said, you know what, I would really want to help people. I want to bless people and be a blessing because I've been blessed. And if I get a word of the Lord that comes to me that could help our culture, that could help our nation, that could help my next door neighbor, my friend or my family or my church or my minister or any ministry, I'm going to give it if I feel it really is witnessing by the Holy Spirit. If it is given so that it's given in a James 3.17 fruit in my life, if it's given under the unction and the timing of the Lord in a disciplined sense, and if it lines up with the Bible, if your ministry lines up with the Bible. So there are qualifications. Paul writes, I'd rather anybody speak with prophecy because then people can understand what you're saying. It's not in some unknown tongue. And that it will build up people. Verse 6, now, brethren, says Paul, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what will it prophesy? What will it help you unless I speak to you in plain old English back then, Aramaic, Hebrew, whatever it was, Greek, Scythian? All right, I'm going to come to you, but if I speak only in tongues, it won't do you any good. I'm going to give you something that really helps you, and that is something that will bring you revelation, knowledge in the spirit of prophecy or edification, encouragement, or doctrine. Verse 7, even things without life giving sound, those things such as a harp or a lyre, they can be heard. Okay, and it keeps on going. But I don't want to get into that because of time. Verse 10, it talks about, you know, those are the main things, prophecy versus praying in tongues. Verse 10, but there are many voices. There are so many kinds of voices in the world, and each one is with, each one is with significance in the Greek Excuse me, in the King James Version, it says, There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them was without significance. 
if you look at it that way, there's no voice, that no person's voice, no kind of voice, maybe a voice on, you know, those android voices or those robot voices. There's, it sounds like to me, not trying to get weird, not trying to go flaky now on you, but I'm thinking there's no voice that is without significance, whether it's in your sleep, in your dream, advice, counsel, TV teaching, talking, principal, whatever. Evaluate it by Holy Spirit, James 3.17, no spirit of fear, power, love, and a sound mind, and then keep on trusting the Lord. We're going to have to close on this installment. We could keep on going because there's a lot more to say, but I believe that if anything out of all this, don't be a hyper-perfectionist about this. Love the Lord. If you feel it's don't say I've got to prophesy or is this a prophecy you know the spirit of revelation comes out in your knowledge with the Lord after time and whether you're in a word of wisdom a word of knowledge a spirit of prophecy sometimes it's really hard to tell don't be so worked up about it just do your best the main thing is the goal build up edify, comfort, strengthen, and do it in such a manner that it is not offensive, unpleasant to those that hear you. Do it in the James 3.17 fashion that any wisdom, any wisdom at all, any wisdom that comes from above that truly represents God has got to be, first of all, pure, peaceable, easily entreated, full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality and without hypocrisy and to the best of my ability on and off this camera we are trying to act that same way James 317 style God bless you you have a great day if the Lord tells you to pray for us please do if you see my face my talking head during the week go for it if he says send a love offering our message is do it as unto the Lord in a relationship with him Send it in, but do it, as he says, give in secret and the Lord will reward you openly. If he says, how can we help? We do things to do, you know, help build the ministry, do a better TV production or give advice or music. Just contact me at bcreativet at gmail.com. God bless you and have a great day. God loves you. Bye-bye.